So Sam, Jesus, when he was here, was he a man that worshiped God? Yes, as the perfect man, he worshiped his father. So then he died and he's resurrected. He goes to heaven and he still has a God, yes or no? I said that because he's a man, he still has a God over him. That doesn't- Where's, like where, When's he gonna be God again? He never ceased to be God for him to be God again. He was God on earth, God in heaven. And if I'm gonna show you, I can very easily. Because number one, John 20, 28, post-resurrection. Thomas said to him, the Lord of me and the God of me, and if you say that's because God is in him, that doesn't work because God is also in us. And yet you cannot say of me, I'm your Lord and your God. So you're going to have to come up with a better response. Well, again, men are called gods in scripture. So you want me to start? Exodus 4, 16, 7, 1, Psalm 82, 1 and 6. I know what you're referring to. Number one, if you're referring to Exodus 4, 16, 7, 1, there it says that God will make Mo Moses a God to Pharaoh and to Aaron because he functions in the role of God. None of them, nowhere in the entire Old Testament, none of them were ever identified identified and worshiped by the Israelite as their Lord and God. So no one came up to Moses. Pharaoh did not come up to Moses. Aaron did not come up to Moses and said, you are my Lord and my God. Thomas said that to Jesus. So this is a false analogy. You're going to have to do better. So after this statement is made, nobody thought Jesus was God. He walked with him for 40 days. Nobody's walking around thinking Jesus is God. You mean except the people that I quoted that thought he was God, like Thomas, John 20, 28, the Lord of me and the God of me? Or when Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 1, our right, God is Savior. Right, let's go over 2 Peter 1, 1. You say that um, he Peter, okay, first, First Peter 1, 3, Jesus said, he claimed, he tells us that the Father is God of Jesus. Number one, you're not addressing what I believe, so I'm going to correct you again. Since you acknowledge as I do, that Jesus is still a man, a glorified man. Therefore, my position is because Christ is one person who's God in flesh. As a man, the father continues to relate to him as his God. But it's not either or. No one denies it. I affirmed it. But what you're not addressing is the same Peter says in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is also our God and Savior. Can we address that and not attack straw man? No, that's what I'm going to bring up. So that's why I'm laying the foundation of what Peter said in, chapter, in his first letter. In the second letter, he makes the statement by the righteousness of our God and Savior. And then he said, Jesus Christ. But then what does he do? He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Can I address so, that? Again, he does the same thing as every writer of the New Testament, and he separates them. God is not Jesus. You're pitting scripture against scripture because no one denies that Jesus is distinct from God the Father. But the grammar of 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 says what it says, and you can't get around it. I'm going to show you why. Because it says, Tu theu emon ke sotieros Jesu Christu. Here you have tu theu emon the God of us, the definite article appears before Theu, connected by K, conjunction N, Soteros, no article before it, Jesu Christu. Grammatically, there is no escaping the fact that the God of us and Savior has one referent, Jesus Christ. And let me explain why. Because he uses the exact identical construction in verse 11. Let me read it for you. Second Peter 1, 11. Tu queriu emon, que Soteros Jesu Christu. The Lord of us and Savior Jesus Christ. No one denies that in 2 Peter 1.11, Peter is saying that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. But the same construction in verse 1, where now instead of Kiriu, it's Theu. That means if you're going to let grammar dictate your theology and not butcher it, there he just called Jesus our God and Savior. And then verse 2 doesn't help your case because though there Jesus is distinguished from the Father, you forget this is a prayer. Grace to you and peace be multiplied knowledge of God and of Jesus the Lord of us. Here he's invoking God and Christ to multiply the blessings on believers. This is what's called an invocation. And he ends with an invocation, a doxology in verse 18, because you said, oh, Jesus said, pray to the Father. Well, hold on. In 2 Peter 3, 18, he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So the same Peter, not only calls Jesus our God and Savior, the same Peter invokes Jesus with the Father to bestow blessings, and he ends it with doxology and a scripture of praise, where you'll not find a single example of someone offering a doxology to a creature in heaven. Peter's not saying Jesus is God. He's clearly making them distinct, just like he did in, in the first letter that he wrote, that God is the Father. You sure? Uh, 
That same first Peter one. Now I can't ask you a question, but I'm going to do it in the cross examination. So be prepared because I'm going to be asking you to show me a single place in the entire Old Testament where the Holy Spirit is attributed to anyone other than Yahweh. And that the Holy Spirit that inspired the prophets is said to be the spirit of someone other than Yahweh. Because the same Peter that you quote in first Peter one, let me read 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, inquiring to know what time or what kind of time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he was predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So Peter, a Jew who knows the Old Testament, he knows the spirit of Yahweh is the one that inspired the prophets, not the spirit of a man, which would be blasphemy or a creature. But here he says that spirit that was in the prophets, spoke to the prophets, is the spirit of Christ. Peter could only say this if he believed that Christ was more than a man. He's Yahweh in the flesh and the Son of God. So the context of Peter refutes you. And there are other examples in 1 Peter 2 that I can show you, but I'll wait for your next objection because it's not helping your case. Psalms 110.1, 1, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. So there it says um, that Adonai used that Jesus, Adonai. my Lord, my Lord, the same thing that Thomas said. This is David, David talking about his future Lord, talking about Jesus, using the same connotation. Now well, here you have God anointing a, a Lord, a human Lord. No, over, it's not even Lord. Over Can I you? Conveniently, you're ignorant of the fact that in Psalm 110, verse 3, in many Hebrew manuscripts and the Greek version, the Latin version, and the Syriac versions actually speak of David's Lord already existing before creation. It says, from the day before the morning star, I have begotten you. So that refutes you. Whoever this Lord is, he was already there, begotten of the Father before creation. This is in many Hebrew manuscripts that use the verb, Yeredika, I've begotten you. And it's also confirmed by the Greek versions of Psalm 110.3, the Latin versions and the Syriac versions showing that they're translating an older form of Psalm 110 where David's Lord already exists and he's already existing with God from before creation. That's number one. Number two. If you read Psalm 110, verses 5 to 7, and you look at the pronouns, there it says, Adonai, at your right hand. Now, I can go into the fact that the Safarim, according to the Mazora, changed the original reading to Yahweh to Adonai, which is why in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says Jehovah at your right hand. In the context, that Jehovah Adonai, who's at your right hand, is David's Lord, because it says he will destroy his enemies in their wrath, and then he will drink brook, water from a brook. That Adonai of Psalm 110, 5, if you read a seven, it says he will drink water from the brook, a human function. So there, David's Lord is Adonai, which according to Mazora was originally Jehovah, and he drinks water. That means he's the God man, God in flesh, which is exactly what I believe. So do you have a better argument? In Revelation, it clearly says in chapter one, he is our high priest to God. To his God, what do you do with that? I do plenty with it because you didn't finish it. There's a doxology offered to Jesus. And let me read it because you don't like to read in context. Here, Revelation 1, 6. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the might forever and ever. Amen. Wow. The very thing that you don't do here, John is doing. He's offering worship to Christ, a doxology given to Christ. To him, the one who made you a priest, if you're a believer which you're not, but I pray you will. Be glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Secondly, Revelation 1, 7 onwards. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Also here he's described as the son of man, the one whose kingdom will never be destroyed. Then you didn't read Revelation 1, 12 to 18, Stacy. There, then I turned, Revelation 1, 12 to 18, to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it was been when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. So Stacy here, John attributes to Christ, Daniel 7, 9, and 10. There it's the ancient of days, but Jesus appears as ancient days. That's God Almighty. He also ascribes to Jesus, Ezekiel 124, 26, 28, where God's voice is depicted as a sound of rushing waters, many waters, and where God appears in visible form as a man. And that description is applied to Christ. So the same revelation shows Christ receives worship in the utmost sense, doxologies. He's described as God Almighty because he's the ancient of days, not just the son of man, though he's not the father. He's also described as the glory of Yahweh when Yahweh appeared to Ezekiel in visible form. Yahweh was seen above the throne and Ezekiel bowed to him, which is the exact relation reaction of John. Because here, Revelation 1, 17, 18, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. 
And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not fear. I am the first and last, the living one. And was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the power of death and Hades. So that same chapter, Jesus is described as more than a man, as God Almighty in the flesh, though not the Father, and even attributes himself first and the last. Stacy, read in context, it destroys your Unitarianism. All right, so everywhere in the Revelations, it specifically says the Almighty and the Lamb, or of and his Christ, never together as the same being. So clearly, the writer of Revelations everywhere is separating the, who God is and who Jesus is. It clearly says in chapter one, God specifically, and then it says Jesus is the one that's first, is the first resurrection, our high priest who is God. The breakdown is chapter one. And if, if what you say is true in verse 12 through 18, then clearly the writer completely forgot about it because the rest of the book, it says the Almighty and his Lamb, or it'll say our Lord and his Christ. So if you go to Revelations 11, where it says in verse 15, the kingdom of our world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Now, now here they're talking about the Lord of the universe, the Father, and of his Christ, his anointed. So this whole thing never unfolds, like I say. So what do you do with that? Very easy. I do plenty with it. So you ready for the answer? You beg the question, assume that Christ has never called Almighty. He is. If I read the context of Revelation 1, seven downwards first eight there it's christ who says he's the almighty pantocrator this is further confirmed in five verse six where the lamb is de depicted with seven horns seven eyes which are the se seven spirits of god that roam throughout the earth the word seven in revelation is symbolic of perfection the word horn in revelation 17 12 means king a king with kingdom and sovereignty so that means the lamb is described as the almighty king has perfect sovereignty and the seven eyes of the lamb if you go to zechariah 3 verse 9 and zechariah 4 10 those are the seven eyes of yahweh what in the world are they doing on the face of the lamb if he's not yahweh so you're wrong and then ironically relation 11 15 you didn't finish the verse because you've been trying to convince us that christ will be subject to the father let me finish the verse the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he will reign forever and ever oh christ will reign forever and ever which you've been trying to deny. So this passage shows that Christ reigns forever. It shows he's the almighty and he is the first and the last in the same sense that Yahweh is in the Old Testament. And on top of that, what do you do? With, and I'm not asking the question. I'm just saying Revelation 513. Since you don't believe Jesus is God equal to the father, but a creature, Houston, we got problems. Revelation 513. And every created thing, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the sea and all thing, things in them. Notice every created thing. In heaven, every great thing on earth, under the earth, in the sea, all things in them, all creation I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne, to the lamb. Stacy, it's over for you, buddy. Because if the lamb is a creature, how in the world is he distinguished from every created thing in all of creation? And how in the world does the lamb receive from every created thing the exact same blessing, honor, glory, and might, and for the same duration, forever and ever? So if Jesus is a creature, this is idolatry. If Jesus is a creature, we have a contradiction. Because here we have in God's presence a creature being worshipped by all creation, which is a contradiction. If it's all creation, he should be with them worshipping God. He's distinguished from them on the side of the creator, receiving the same honor that the creator receives. This destroys your Unitarianism. So Jesus said, pray to the Father. Where's Jesus' teachings that he's God? Okay, yeah. now notice two unrelated questions. I think you're more confused than you realize. No, Praying to the Jesus Father. Well, let me repeat. Why are you cutting me off? Take it easy, Stacy. I know... It's no, there, there's the question. Where's Jesus teach that he's God? All over the scriptures. But let me answer your butchering. The same Jesus who's now. Go. Are you going to cut me off again? Are you going to be, are you going to show that you're demonized and cut me off? Or are you going to constrain yourself? Right. Pretend that you have the Holy Spirit in you and not demonized. Let me refute your butchering of scripture. First of all, you keep quoting Jesus out of context. Jesus didn't simply say, worship the Father. He also, or pray to the Father. He also said, pray to me. John 14, 13 of 14. What do you not get? You will ask in my name and I will do it so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. You may ask me in my name and I will do it. That's prayer. That's number one. That's why in Acts 7, 59, Stephen, the first Christian martyr filled with the Spirit, cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And that prayer you will find in Psalm 31, 5, where the psalmist says, into your hands I commit my spirit. So they're praying to Jesus in heaven the way they pray to Yahweh in the Old Testament. So stop 
butchering scripture and pitting scripture against scripture. And where do we see Jesus claiming to be God? All over, if you listen. Let me give you an example in the context of worship. In Matthew 21, 15 and 16, the religious authorities are livid that the children are glorifying Christ saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Citing Psalm 118, 22 to 25, all the way to 26. And yet saying that to the son of David. And they say, do you not hear what they're saying? In other words, hey, silence them for saying Hosanna to you. Because that word Oshiana comes from Psalm 118, 22 to 26, where the psalmist says to Jehovah, Hosanna. It's to Jehovah in Psalm 118. 22 to 26, not to a creature. But then Jesus, yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise. Mm -hmm. Jesus then quotes Psalm 8, verses 1 to 2, Stacy, specifically verse 2, a psalm where the psalmist says that even babes and sucklings will glorify Jehovah to silence his enemies. But Jesus said Psalm 8, 2 confirms that what the children are doing are right. So when the children praise me, and ascribe to me, Hosanna, which is ascribed to Job in Psalm 118, 22, 26. They are right because the psalmist says that's what children do in the presence of Jehovah, not a creature. And they're doing it to silence you, my enemies, who like you are too blind to see that Job in the flesh. You got your theology is whack. It got destroyed by Jesus right there. So what's the other question? Gentlemen, and before you do, Stacey, I've given you some extra time just to make sure that you're getting all your, your questions out. But we are at time now so what we'll do stacy real quick follow-up question sam real quick answer and then we're going to transition into our second 30-minute cross exam all right so blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord that's that's what you're talking about jesus came in the father's name exactly like every messenger in scripture they came in the father's name jesus was clear john 5 43 and john 17 11 he came in the father's name jesus is Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. The Father is the Savior through Christ. That's what the scripture is about. And so that's so just because it says Yahweh does not mean it's actually Yahweh. Just like the angels um in uh Genesis 19. He's preaching. These angels are called lords because they're yes, you remember a question Lord mark on <laughs> Keeps I see a lot of periods, but you got to get a question mark in there. Yeah, I'm just answering question. your question. You, you, you're bringing up. I didn't ask you a question. You're supposed to ask me. You forgot? Oh, I know no, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just answering. Okay, guys, let, <laughs> let's yeah. just consider that all a big question. Sam, feel free to respond, and then we're going to go yeah. into our second phase. No, you, Jay, uh, Stacey, I was referring to Psalm 118.25, where it says, O Yahweh save, O Shiana. It's in Psalm 118.25. The context is 22.26. There they say to Yahweh in Hebrew, Oshiana, save, O Yahweh. But in Matthew 21, 15 and 16, the children say to Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. Now the religious authorities, because they knew their Bible, they knew you cannot say Hosanna to a mere creature because that's the wording of Psalm 118, 25 said about Yahweh. Did Jesus rebuke them because he's not Yahweh and rebuke the children? No, because they say to him, do you not hear what they're saying? And she said, yes. Have you ever read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes? You have prepared for praise for yourself. He's quoting Psalm 8 too, which is about babes praising Jehovah, not a creature. And he's saying, yeah, the psalmist said, this is what you should expect. Children are going to praise me because that's what children do. When they see me, they recognize who I am. But wait, Psalm 8 is about children praising Jehovah. And you don't believe Jesus, Jehovah. How then does that justify the children praising Jesus? Because he's Job in the flesh. He's not your Jesus. And the Father is not your God. So deal with the arguments, not strawman.